like to say that I have the honor of introducing our first session, a fireside chat with three of the biggest names in our industry today. I'd like to welcome to the stage Deborah Dunsire. She's president and CEO of Millennium, a Takeda, onco a Takeda oncology company. James C. Mullen, president and CEO of Biogen IDEC, and Henry Tremere, chairman, president, and CEO of Genzyme Corporation. So we have a round of applause as we introduce our guests. Okay, good morning everyone. I'm the privileged one who gets to moderate today's session with two uh, luminaries and veterans of our industry. Dare I say, battle-scarred and some, when you've had a career this long, um, you're going to have a few stories to tell. And today, it's really our unique opportunity to hear from, from these two gentlemen how they've thought about their businesses over years and how that relates to today and what advice they might have for entrepreneurs who are with us today starting companies or dealing with emerging companies and what's different about today than the times that they've faced in, in the past. And these two companies are arguably the most successful biotech companies and have grown over pretty much three decades from scratch here in Cambridge or in Massachusetts. So I think we have a pretty unique opportunity first to hear uh, from Henry, who's been, I think, the longest serving CEO of almost any pharma or biotech uh, company having been CEO since uh, 1985 at uh, Genzyme. And of course, uh, Jim Mullen joined Biogen back in 1989 and became CEO in 2000. So both of you have had the opportunity to see enormous amounts of change and have built your companies over, over many years. So I think we're standing on, hopefully, the other side of the chaos and economic crisis of 2008 and 2009. Um, but of course, that's not the first uh, crisis that these two companies have weathered as they've grown. So we're going to look back first and then look forward, uh, thinking about the, the change that these companies have gone through, the storms that they've, that they've weathered, and then look at what lessons we can take away. Um, so let me start, you know, without much more ado, and Henry, I'll address the, the first question uh, to you. You know, when I think about the formation of Genzyme, and, and it's a company built through many acquisitions, it's had its own innovation, it's brought in innovation, what do you see as the similarities today and the differences today for companies that are just at that stage that Genzyme was back in uh, when it was formed? Now, th there is no other explanation around uh, Genzyme's success uh, than that we were fortunate enough early in our development to do something that actually turned out to work. Better lucky than smart. <laughs> <laughs> any lesson, don't work on stuff that doesn't work. <laughs> Focus on that, what works. Uh, we were fortunate. We, we focused on, on uh, a, a treatment for Cauchy disease. That was very early on in the company. That was the reason I joined. Uh, because there was this connection um, uh, with uh, the NIH and this enzyme replacement therapy that was about to be um, used on the first human. Um, and um, it was fascinating. I was at Baxter. I was uh, familiar with uh, factor eight and factor nine for the treatment of hemophilia, also very orphan diseases, uh, very specific treatments. The missing factors were given to these patients and then the blood clots. And I saw the value of it, and I wasn't afraid that it was such an orphan disease at the time. And we were fortunate enough at Genzyme early on to have uh, this treatment for Cauchy disease in collaboration with the NIH, 
and I have it work in 1984 on the very first patient, and I remember that patient well. Uh, and uh, that patient had an, uh, was very sick, was three years old, and had an immediate, very, very positive reaction uh, to the treatment. And, and every time we ran out of the time we were extracting it from placentas, we were uh, seeing that the patient uh, lost the benefit. And then we started treatment again, and the patient got the benefit. And um, that had such effect, and then there is a long story of 10 years of getting this to where it became an actual therapy. Uh, 10 remarkable years where we were extracting it from placenta in the middle of the HIV crisis, and we were every time able to overcome the challenges that were in front of us, because it was worthwhile to overcome these challenges. Uh, people joined us in that uh, work that led to the therapy of these patients. Uh, and uh, I think, Deborah, that that really has been it for us, because then we uh, learned the power. When, once we learned the power of doing something that works and focusing on it, uh, we did more of that. And we generally would now have about 15 different therapies uh, in the marketplace. At least 12 of them were the first therapies for those uh, diseases. Um, and every time it made an important clinical contribution. Uh, and it was every time we found global support for that contribution to be uh, supported from a regulatory point of view, from a payment point of view, and from uh, the point of view of, of um, other supports that we needed to get there. Uh, and so I, my advice to anyone, uh, any one of us that still is in that very early, extremely exciting moment, that magnificent moment of, of making the selection of where you focus, um, is to make sure you understand that it can succeed. And then make sure you have 10 years to get there, because it takes a long time. So a decade, a decade of investment to that first product. I think that's probably one of the most challenging questions that all of us face in, in biotech, because that's not an un uncommon story. And investors, I think, have somewhat changed their perspective on how long and how patient they're willing to be and you know want companies to get into profitability and, and you know commercialization faster um, so there the are different ways of doing that different ways of supporting the company going through and you know Jim the, maybe before your time but the first products from from Biogen were actually partnered and then the decision was made to commercialize particularly with the you know the drug that changed mm. lives in in Avonex. People often ask about, you know, when's the, what's the right time to think about a commercial infrastructure? How do you think about that? Tell us the thinking that went behind the partnering decisions and then the decision to really commercialize. Well, the objective from the very beginning was to commercialize the products. The question is, how do you get to, uh, you know, through all the developments? We were fortunate, and this, you know, predates me, but the founders brought alpha interferon, beta interferon, gamma interferon, and the hepatitis B vaccines. Mm -hmm or the technology that resulted in that. Um, and what, what it, you, you sit back and you look at is, well, what capabilities and what capital do you really have in terms of being able to develop and commercialize products? Uh, I think decisions were made in the early and mid 80s that some of these early programs needed to be partnered. That was the right decision because clearly those products came to the market in the hepatitis B vaccines, um, alpha interferon uh, with shearing plow. That in turn created a flow of capital via the royalties back into the company that really gave us the latitude, which was unusual at that time, where we weren't out raising money all the time. Mm -hmm. right? We had a cash flow stream that was large enough to fund a few programs fully and to reserve the rights as long as we wanted to. And so that really enabled you to think about what's the right product that is, if you will, uh, targeted enough in terms of where you need to go, novel enough in terms of um, mm -hmm. the product itself, and you know where you think you can compete uh, in the marketplace. That turned out to be Avonex, but even that story is, you know, it, it ended up in MS. It's a two billion dollar drug in MS. That's not what it was being developed for at the beginning. So, you know, you you have to um, be patient. You've got to hang around and survive enough failures to get the opportunities. 
but there was an opportunity where we had the capital, it was an appropriate level of risk. The commercial build out in the US was relatively modest, it was a few hundred people, um, and, and we could afford that financial risk at that point in time. And we also decided almost simultaneously that we would take it internationally, at least mm -hmm. in the key markets, which we did uh, in the mid 90s as well. But again, you know, we had the capital flow to take that level of risk. So interesting to see the, the build of the company based on the, on the partnerships, and certainly for Millennium, that was a critical success factor, the partnering of, of Velcade outside the US, reserving the, the US rights, and that's been very successful. Sometimes one always looks back and wishes you had the whole, the whole enchilada, if you like, um, and both of you have, have done that. You made the decision to commercialize ex-US, which is a pretty bold uh, move, so maybe you can you can comment on that, uh, yeah. the, both of you. I, uh, this this is different. When when Genzyme started in in the early 80s, uh, uh, the international markets were uh, Europe, Japan, uh, and uh, but today, since you know in the period of time that it takes to develop these programs and products, the next 10, 15 years, 20 years. Uh, the international markets are much larger. So if I have any advice uh, to any one of you, is to don't license out XUS uh, without really thinking it through very carefully and getting a very, very good return on the deal if you do make the deal. In the next uh, 20 years, 15 years, uh, inevitably, China and India will become very important markets. And the day to day uh, is you can look the data up. These markets want to leapfrog. They want to innovate. They don't have healthcare systems, but they have demand emerging. The market for modern medicine, the kind of medicines that all of us are engaged in developing, uh, the new markets are, uh, China and India are by far the larger new markets for this. And the size of these markets are comparable to Europe and the United States for the new products. And the way to penetrate and to engage in them are different and more open, more entrepreneurial, more pioneering, uh, less saturated than what we're dealing with in this country or in Europe or in Japan. Uh, but it takes uh, real work to think through how you do that. And it takes having the rights to do it. And if you're too early because you think you have some immediate need to monetize something in order to afford to do something, you may, you may actually cut yourself short uh, quite materially. We took uh, the decision early on, very early on, because uh, we were dealing in a very orphan area that we would do it ourselves. Um, and um, I remember when Genentech came to me, Bob Swanson, uh, we've about three or four years before to start the market and, and the circumstances around Genentech and its portfolio was such that they could, uh, he was telling me, give me three years with your product. I know what to do with it, see what I've done with human growth hormone. I can do something the same with uh, zero days for Gaucher disease. And I went to uh, California, I looked at what they had done, they had done fantastic work because it was a great company. And, and still a great company. Um, and uh, we could have benefited, but we decided we can also do this by ourselves. And we didn't say that in an arrogant way. We said it in, it's worthwhile to do it. It's worthwhile to succeed in that. And we built the international uh, uh, approaches ourselves. So now this product <coughs> is being used in over 100 countries. Um, and by far the larger market is international. Europe is about, um, about 40, 50 percent larger than U.S. sales. Um, and you know, when you deal in a limited market in an ultra-orphan uh, environment, um, you know, that makes a massive difference in terms of ultimately the return you get. Uh, so I would say that uh, the big difference today is that the globe, the worldwide market for the products that all of us are focused on working in the period of time that these products will become a reality has become much greater than it was uh, 20 years ago. 
Well, Henry and I are in complete agreement on that. Um, and, and I think just to add a couple, I want to just add a couple things to Henry because everything I'm going to say is in addition to what Henry just said. Just if you look back 10 or 15 years, you know, the EU has only been around for a fairly short period of time, and from then it's gone from 15 to 25 countries. So, you know, just from that, um, the U.S. changes in healthcare and the ones that we've seen in the last couple of weeks, I think, can mean that there's going to be more and more and more pressure on uh, product growth and profitability here in the U.S. Um, it's also been our experience over the last number of years that the growth outside the U.S. Um, is more robust than inside the U.S. and the market, you know, in absolute terms is larger. And that's really without much contribution coming from places like India and China, which are going to be big, big targets uh, in the future. So, you know, whatever you're doing with your development, your products today, you better have a global strategy. And you, and you need to make sure you actually extract the right amount of value. Because, you know, everybody has to make the decision what they're going to do based on the situation of their company, the capitalization, and whatever. But one of the big things that the street misses, they don't get this at all. Mm -hmm. They do not get the ex-US um, potential at all. They're still using the old uh, rule of thumb, 60% of your profit's going to come from inside the US, 40% outside. They completely ignore what's going outside the, the US. Um, so you've got some real education to do. And there will be certain products that have a much bigger potential outside the U.S. for could be demographic or genetic reasons or anything. So. Right. I think that's that's something that's emerged in you know across the pharmaceutical world, particularly in the biotech, with these you know very uh, focused markets. That the the markets outside the U.S. are very significantly larger, and I totally agree with you that that gets missed by the street. And if you have a, a market as as you both have had, and you know as I as I think about uh, Oncology, that's one of those markets too, where you don't need an enormous infrastructure. So would I recommend a, a company save the diabetes rights? Maybe not, if that was your first launch. Uh, but when you look at, at markets that require a smaller infrastructure, uh, certainly the value outside of the US is growing exponentially. Um, from my days at, at Novartis, certainly saw that in the oncology business that outside the U.S. was very, very significantly larger and growing in those emerging markets. Um, so the balance has changed, and I think we need to get away from the paradigm of thinking of, of even some companies who are so passionate about retaining U.S. rights, they may actually do their shareholders a better favor retaining the ex-U.S. rights. Um, although that may be taking things a little bit far. Now, Jim, you made an interesting um, decision, particularly in, in, in a challenging market, Japan, to go as a biogen force. And that, that's a, you know, it's a very potentially big market, a very rich market, but a very difficult one to, to access. How did you think about that? Uh, well, the question is, um, you know, the, it is the second biggest autonomous market in the world, uh, and it was really a question, a decision we made, and again, we had, you know, the luxury at that point of, we were already launched everywhere else, we had a good basis, but made the decision that, um, and it's a similar decision we made in our country, which is, if you want to learn about what's going on, you've got to have your own people on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, and we made the decision that we needed to do that, that meant we were going to have to have some R&D in China or in Japan so that we could do the clinical development there. We were going to have to go meet with the regulators. I've been with the regulators many times in Japan. Um, we were going to have to meet with the key opinion leaders. We were just going to have to learn the business. And also it was, you know, my view at the time that what you were seeing was actually a fairly significant shift in the way business was going to get done in Japan from you know, the medical representatives, as they call them in Japan, which would be the sales reps, you know, their job used to be to be the gophers for the physicians, and now it's really turned into a much more professional um, sort of selling model like we see in the U.S. and Europe, um, where it's, it's not about providing, if you will, ancillary services to the doctor, like washing their car and getting their lunch, but actually delivering information and value about Did products. Did do that here? <laughs> Henry, how did you think about the Asian markets, particularly? Now, we worked together, yeah. Jim and I did. In fact, we, we, in 1987, we could hardly walk. We opened an office in Japan. 
Um, and we went to MITI, which is a national NIH-like organization, and said, we like a grant, non-refundable grant, uh, because we want to set up biotechnology in Japan. There was not much biotechnology at the time. And lo and behold, they gave us a grant. And we set up a laboratory, and um, we did carbohydrate research there, which was the underlying technology that uh, uh, made Serozyme work. And uh, uh, this was in 1987, the first product for Genzyme, therapeutic product got approved in, in uh, 1990. And uh, we developed from there. That grant supported us in the early days. Uh, and we now have a fully integrated uh, infrastructure in Japan. We do all our own clinical work, including uh, Jim and I work together with Avenex, mm -hmm. on Avenex, uh, uh, that got uh, approved in, in Japan a while ago. Um, and uh, it's now our second largest market, which is supposed to be. It just beat France. The French <laughs> don't take it lightly. They are uh, competing uh, harshly back. But they, uh, 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 Japan appropriately, because a much larger population, and the pricing mechanism in Japan is uh, different. It is a little bit uh, crazy. You know, it's a price control system. You come up with the first product, you negotiate a very high price. Eventually, these prices uh, are taken down by the government in a uh, in an way with, um, with some discussion, but a little bit mechanical way. Uh, but for us, it meant that a product uh, that was already quite expensive in therapeutic terms per patient, um, the Japanese government decided to, uh, to double its price in Japan. And they said the explanation is we like this kind of product. We like more of these kinds of products. And they, they really uh, set up an enormous incentive system for people to do this. Now, the hurdle in Japan is material. The cost of doing clinical trials in Japan is high. It is way higher than anywhere else in the world. Uh, the, the bureaucracy is extraordinary. Uh, but if you have something that truly makes a difference in the clinical sense, the Japanese will figure it out with you. And if you give it to Sumitomo or some other Japanese company, you will always be outside, an outsider. And you always wonder how much you're missing. And it's, it's, uh, you will get some return, but it will not move your needle. Uh, you have to do this by yourself and, and uh, start modestly, ask for some support as we did at the time, uh, and then have the patience to stick to it by yourself. And, and, and uh, the reward is extraordinary once you once you get 10, 15 years later, if the product really makes a clinical difference. Yeah. I think that, you know, obviously, Japan is very central on my geographic map uh, these days <laughs> since we, we became uh, part of uh, Takeda. And it's certainly true, the Japanese uh, health system is really set up to try and support and encourage the development of orphan drugs. So drugs for rare diseases, and in fact, with the latest changes in the approach to pricing of pharmaceuticals in Japan, um, companies will get a break, if you like, on some of their um, more mass market drugs, which are typically reduced in price over, over the years, if they are developing orphan drugs. So there's, there's almost a quid pro quo. There's really a, an incentive system put in place. So if you truly do have an orphan drug, it's really worth taking Henry's advice very seriously and, and moving it forward. If you don't have one of those products, so the one thing that I have learned in being much more intimately exposed to the Japanese market is that there is a bias towards the Japanese companies from Japanese doctors. So it's very clear that if you're going to be in a cardiovascular segment, diabetes, osteoporosis, those types of markets, it's going to be much harder to compete against the Japanese companies and your product will certainly get a much stronger lift from, from working with them. So it's a, it's a kind of a, a decision about how strong are you to build the infrastructure? How strong is your product to be the vanguard um, of your presence in that marketplace? 
So, you know, let's come back to this, the idea of the emerging markets, the European markets, the, the rest of the world being so much more of a growth area than the traditional US has been. What does that say to you about talent acquisition and, and management in, in your companies? How have you seen that change? What do you look for today that you may not have before? Well, the first is obviously people that have worked in these international markets and understand how to work in those markets. Uh, and we've spent a lot of time over the last 10, 12 years, you know, selecting people that have done that, um, trying to make it a more multinational, multicultural uh, corporation, but hang on to the culture of the company and these affiliate organizations and moving people around, whether that's geographically or across organizational boundaries, if you will, um, to continue to try to, you know, both diffuse all of that knowledge and, and sensibility through the organization, but also sort of bring some of these barriers down that sort of naturally grow up. You know, it's all around the talent, and you've got to, you've got to look all over the world for the talent, and there's a lot of it out there now. I mean, that's the good news. Um, I can tell you, though, the talent acquisition when you're in Europe or India or China or Japan, um, it's not like people moving companies here locally right. where, you know, people don't have to change parking spots. But there are, you know, some significant cultural biases against startup companies and small companies. So it takes some time to build your brand, if you will, to attract the right talent. And you've got to, you've got to spend some time on that. And Henry, how did you think about local acquisition of talent versus moving people from the U.S. to those markets? How have you? Uh, yeah, it, it, it's, um, to, to Jim's point, it, it is a global market. The market for talent is very global, and, and it doesn't have borders. It doesn't have um, limitations in some sense. If you're prepared to, to overcome some of the costs associated with moving people around, yeah, we are very fortunate in, in Massachusetts. We have extraordinary talent for very good reasons in this cluster of, of, uh, uh, of organizations, and, uh, which is very unique on a global basis. Uh, there is no doubt about it. It is one of the most amazing uh, melting pots of global talent uh, that comes together in, um, in Massachusetts and, and refreshes itself through the academic institutions in a very natural way. Uh, so, uh, the talent here is highly competitive, uh, but uh, the experience uh, we, combined with talent uh, that uh, you know, when you do business in China, you need experience of doing business in China, and you need uh, people with talent uh, to end that experience combined. Uh, sending somebody from here to China and say, start it up, uh, it's, it's not uh, realistic. Uh, so you need to find local uh, talent that has the local experience, the local entrepreneurial capability to get things done, uh, and is competitive with the kind of talent you have here. Um, rotation, which we have increasingly started to utilize, it was something that became an opportunity within the company, uh, or more recognized of an opportunity within the company in the, in the recent years. Um, of experienced people within the company whom you know uh, also provides a tremendous uh, ability to, um, to continue to develop people and to continue to, um, uh, to put people in the place where they can make the greatest contribution. Uh, our companies, the things we do, uh, all of us here in this room, uh, we deal with uh, trying to find solutions for important disease situations. These diseases occur around the world, everywhere. And the objective always has to be to reach all the patients, not just those that speak your language uh, or that are next, by, uh, next door. Uh, so finding uh, an orientation that's truly global, uh, allowing that to develop both in your own thinking and in the thinking within the company and finding talent that helps you with that, I think is a very important uh, ingredient of building the company to its maximum uh, ultimate potential. Hmm. I guess the other thing to, to think about in terms of, of talent is what type of business you're in. And, and over time, uh, Genzyme has you know, the core business in these very rare mm. diseases, but has diversified through, through acquisition. And 
How have you thought about that? Because sometimes the, you know, the conventional wisdom can be focus, focus, you know, build expertise, and you've really had a, a broader range or a broader lens on that. So talk about how that's changed the company. How did you think about those acquisitions? Now, these weren't just acquisitions, uh, Deborah. We, we were diversified from day one. Uh, and uh, the reason was, the way we started was um, uh, to combine some venture capital with some management with eight professors from MIT who were multidisciplinary. And uh, so very early on, we worked on uh, polysaccharides, hyaluronic acid. That has led to uh, some very important products that today make up about $700 million in revenue. Uh, we worked on enzyme replacement therapy which today uh, has made its uh, mark within the company. But very early on, we were quite diversified. We were in diagnostics from day one. In fact, that's where it started in, in some sense. We still are today. Uh, when we merged with integrated genetics in 1989, uh, we, uh, a, a diagnostic services uh, activity uh, was part of integrated genetics at the time. And we developed it. Today, it is a $400 million uh, uh, business that gives us an entry point in something what we think is exciting in personalized medicine uh, in, in the future, but also uh, in the short term. You know, personalized medicine, I think, is tremendously powerful uh, because it, it, it allows you to uh, have the ambition to make uh, a treatment highly specific uh, to a disease. And the value of doing that uh, is extraordinary. Uh, the reason that serozyme is, and, and myozyme, or febozyme for fibre disease, Gaucher disease, or pompa disease are so successful are these are personalized medicine products. Uh, they work every time, 100% of the time, and they make a significant clinical difference. And we can diagnose these patients perfectly. Uh, and it is not trial and error, as, as so often, unfortunately, mm -hmm. uh, so many products still are. Uh, so, being on the diagnostic, uh, having a diagnostic component and thinking and ability to utilize that allows you to think about the service you provide with the product uh, in a broader way. So, diversification has many roles, but it, it has a role, the role in a an, in an pure financial sense of making you less dependent on a single uh, program. And that, I think, makes good financial sense. And, we saw that last year we got this uh, significant stumble that all of us have been able to read about. Um, and uh, that, uh, and, but we had a positive cash flow last year in a significant way uh, because we were uh, diversified. We were able to overcome uh, this, uh, this problem uh, and manage our way through that because of diversification. But diversification also creates opportunity. It is very difficult, as the large companies show us, to brute force breakthroughs. Uh, Pfizer has Lipitor, a billion dollars a month, uh, and has been spending a significant portion of that to come up with encores in cardio uh, diseases, and has given up and says, after the product runs out of patent, we will be out of this whole field, um, because they couldn't brute force their way to the next solutions in the same space. Um, and so diversification allows you to think about a broader set of opportunities, rather than think that the only area of opportunity is that area where you have your most immediate focus. Uh, so there are lots of roles, and I, I've been a proponent of it. Uh, it is a matter of taste. Sometimes shareholders say you get distracted. Uh, they often say that, depending on the share price. If the share price is low, then you're distracted. <laughs> <laughs> the share, all, if the share price is high, they say, You're how, a how bright uh, the set of decisions you made. <laughs> Jim, as, you know, as you've thought, thought about building Biogen, probably one of the biggest transformations was the conversion from Biogen to Biogen IDEC, uh, which you know, blended a, a lot of skills built on what seems to have been pillars of, of success, but comes along with some challenges. So, as people think about acquisition, merger, partnering, what do you see as some of the, the biggest pros and benefits to a merger um, versus some of the challenges you have to step up to the plate to manage? Well, we went into that merger with some very specific objectives and, um, 
you know, it's kind of interesting. Bill Rester and I got to know each other because we were having a patent dispute. <laughs> so we were having a long, ra raging, you know, discussion. I guess that's probably the best way you could put it about a patent issue. But yeah, we'll keep it it, 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 out of those discussions, it became clear that there were some um, interesting similarities and problems at both sets of companies. But it goes right back to uh, what Henry said. It, it, it was a different variation on diversification, right? We both had, you know, one great product. Um, did you have enough pipeline uh, mm -hmm. to consistently develop new products? Probably no. I mean, I think the history has shown that, that we didn't. Um, were we competitive in business development? No. Um, how were we allocating capital? It turns out where we were investing, where we were planning to invest was to go in directions that they already had capabilities and vice versa. So there was this interesting opportunity to take advantage of a broad technology play, because we were both very broad in research in immunology. Mm -hmm. They were taking theirs more into the oncology space, and we were taking it more into the autoimmune spaces. But we could both see that there were opportunities on the other side of the fence, and it's turned out to be the case. These products have crossed over into the other areas. Um, so, you know, we were doing that from the position of, you know, how do you build the company? How do you create better opportunity success? Um, how can you become more competitive in the areas you're going to need to compete? And, and for us, one of them was business development. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of your pipeline, I don't care whether you're, you know, our size or half our size or quarter size or ten times our size, more research is going on outside your company than inside your company. And more ideas are going to come from outside your company than inside your company. And you've got to figure out how to organize your, yourself in a way that you are receptive to those and you can spot those opportunities. Um, and, you know, we're partners for some of the companies that are in this room today um, who are going through where we were 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you just, you, you know, that was a play. Now, what are the challenges? The challenges are always the obvious ones, right? Somebody's got to run it. You've got cultural differences. In this case, we had geographic difference. We had different historical things. And you know, the only thing I can say is, don't you know, get on with making the decisions and get on with running the business. You can spend a, an awful lot of unproductive time um, trying to do the old um, sandlot baseball uh, mm -hmm. routine, which is well, one from your team, one from that team, one from this team. One, you know, and, and, and that's shareholders don't care about that and neither do the rest of the employees of the company. They want to get on with creating products and building value. Mm -hmm. And I su suggest you just sort of push through that as rapidly as possible and, and move forward. Easy to say, hard to do. Yeah, oh, it's uh, hard to do because there's a lot of, as you know, they always talk about the social issues, you know, yeah. that's where you run into them. Right, and I guess our businesses are, are live and die by the talent, and which yeah. is why these <coughs> social issues emerge. But I, I couldn't agree with you more. It's trying to make an even dance and keep everything completely uh, even one-to-one -one is probably a recipe for failure um, rather than a recipe for success. Mm -hmm. And uh, Henry, you've made some very successful acquisitions. What's been the, the secret of making them successfully part of Genzyme? Yeah, we, d we didn't do what uh, Jim described is a, a, a transformative uh, acquisition, a merger of equals almost, what you were describing, uh, which is much tougher to do than what we did. We, we acquired relatively uh, modest-sized uh, companies that were uh, more programs, as many of our companies are, they're really a program rather than a fully integrated corporation, um, and uh, merged them into the company, and uh, for the most part, they provided a, a, a new uh, set of, of skills and capabilities that we actually wanted to keep, wanted to have. Mm -hmm. um, and in the case of Geltex, for instance, a local company that most of you are familiar with, uh, we acquired after we collaborated on a product called Renagel in the renal area, and it became uh, successful, and we saw this is going to be very successful, and, and we uh, discussed uh, an um, acquisition that uh, turned out to be in the interest of both uh, groups of shareholders in an important way. Uh, and uh, that company was based in Walton. And they had at the time maybe 150 employees. Uh, today, in the, on the same site with two more buildings, uh, one more building added, a large building added, 
they have 300 employees. Uh, so it doubled, and uh, these employees, that's where we are now do, uh, doing a lot of our small molecule and polymer research. And uh, many of the people that uh, changed over from Geltex into Genzyme still are there many years later. And um, the reason that that worked is that we had a real need for those skills and capabilities. If it is completely duplicative, it's tough. Mm -hmm. You have to make, you have to be pretty direct and, and, and fair about it and say duplication is untenable. It's too expensive, nobody can afford it, and all of us um, are better off to do things that, that truly add value. And in duplication, there's not enough value that you add, and you have to make the cut. Uh, we did that a few times as well. So let's think about the environment that we face now. Um, and I think one of the principal, uh, shall we say, partners we have is the regulatory authorities, both here and outside the, the US. And I think you know, conventional wisdom has always said you go to the FDA first if you're a US uh, biotech. And maybe that's changing. And Jim, maybe, you know, can you comment on how you're thinking about the, the regulators which you approach first? Right. How have you seen them change? Well, it's, um, I, I would say the first thing is it's, it's hard to generalize because it's quite idiosyncratic by both, uh, you know, the individuals you may have to interact with as well as uh, the therapeutic areas you may be looking at to develop a product. So, um, you know, you, you just told the story about Pfizer. One of the reasons Pfizer and almost everybody else is getting out of cardiovascular disease is because the FDA has made it almost impossible uh, to develop anything in cardiovascular anymore. You know, so what they ask for sounds very logical in headlines that just is completely undoable. Um, so, so people are exiting that for lower risk, um, higher probability areas. Um, you know, it, it pays to really understand who you're going to be dealing with down in the division at the FDA. It gets down to the individual reviewer level and that division and, you know, what are the problems they're trying to deal with? What are the, you know, why are they making the decisions they're making? Um, you know, and where are they getting the heat? You know, if they're getting pulled up to Capitol Hill every second week to answer, and let's just take uh, something in diabetes, and they're getting taken a beating every two weeks, you know, that may not be the first place to start with your next diabetes program. Uh, you may want to start with uh, the EMEA. It tends to be, frankly, a little bit more balanced, or, you know, you can go around and have more informal discussions, you know, with a number of the European authorities uh, to really get a feel for what you're going to do, and it depends on the phase of the product as well. You know, phase one's a different uh, a different deal than two or three. Uh, by the time you get to two or three, you better be having deep conversations with all these regulators uh, because um, you've got to have alignment going in, even though they always have the ability to change their minds later. Um, if you don't have them lined up going in, you, you can be sure you don't have them aligned coming out. So what, what does that say about to when you're building a company about that regulatory function, is that something you build I, very I, strong, very fast? Or? The regulatory function, um, I, I would, the regulatory and a clinical uh, trials group, um, some, you know, some key physicians, I would build that globally early. Mm -hmm. And it needs to be globally near where the regulators are. It, it's, it's hard to do that with just people that are U.S. trained physicians or U.S. trained regulators, uh, regulatory folks, you really need people that have specific deep experience and the network of contacts within the regulators you're trying to deal with. So I, I think that's one of the early investments you make. Mm -hmm. And that's probably not something that, that those companies necessarily always think about early on because it seems like a, an expensive investment. But I think, you know, Jim's advice would suggest it's a real um, protection against risk to the value that you're that you're creating. Henri, any comments to add on? No, that? I I completely agree. It, it, it's it's um, uh, you know the, the clinical work and then eventually the regulatory work, which crea uh, which eventually then creates the label. The label is the value that we are trying to create. That's what you're getting reimbursed eventually. That's what you are able to promote. That's what you're selling. So to Jim's point, 
<laughs> having clinical people that know how to do that side of the equation. And uh, also to Jim's point, having regulatory people that know how to negotiate the label and how to translate the clinical result into the label. Um, and it, it's not a matter of where do I go first. Um, you know you have to go everywhere because the value is uh, determined by your ability to negotiate that label. And if you say, forget the US, it is a headache, you give up tremendous value and it is not right to give that up. Um, and it's not right for patients to give that up. Uh, the task is to get there, uh, whatever that means. And uh, so uh, working with the FDA through all of the idiosyncrasies, working with the EME, EMA uh, through its idiosyncrasies uh, is just the most important thing that we do and to do it right. You don't need to do it all within the company because there are some very excellent CROs and some very excellent advisory organizations that you can work with. But not doing it or doing it late or not having internal views on how you are actually addressing that is just, uh, no, it, it, it's not wise. Uh, you will not get there from here. It, it, it's, you can prove everything you have to prove for yourself. It's not interesting. It's only interesting when it is when you have the label uh, that describes uh, what it is uh, you have. I think the only thing I'd, I'd add to that is that it's you know some of the failures that we've seen recently, even in the in the high unmet need areas at at FDA, have been from companies that didn't necessarily um, hold to the rigor around their endpoints. And I think you have to not fool yourself that somehow the, the um, p-value will carry the day. It only carries the day if you've really got the buy-in and you've really done the trial in a very rigorous way so the metrics are uh, completely ironclad mm -hmm. uh, when it shows up at, at FDA or EMEA. Um, EMEA has been a bit clearer, particularly in certain diseases, that survival, which is hard to misinterpret, um, is, an, is the end point that they look at. And it's part of the reason is because it's so hard to get clarity on the, the measure, how the, the other end points were measured. So don't, don't be fooled um, or don't be led down the, the path of thinking it will be okay um, because we can't really afford to do it in a rigorous way. You may be wasting all the money you're investing. So just, you know, we're coming up to, to closing, and I've got piles more questions, but it, let's take a few minutes as we, as we come towards an end to, to talk about healthcare reform. What have we seen in the past couple of weeks? How do you think it's going to be affecting your businesses? Obviously nothing uh, proprietary or confidential, please. Um, but also, how, do you think it's going to support innovation or be a chill to innovation? How, how do we think about that? Jim, do you want to? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll try to take the first step. I, I think, I mean, clearly you, you can sort of read the details. It's going to impact everybody's business. It depends on how much business you're doing on Medicare, Medicaid, and, and some of the things. You know, that's what you can read today. Um, my bigger concern is that I don't think this health care reform really addressed the fundamental underlying issues that are going to get after cost utilization. So. Um, I personally have the belief that it was a lot of hopeful thinking that you know, anything that's going to control costs. I think what that inevitably means is we're going to see different, you know, different ways to wind down either utilization or costs uh, in ever more brute force ways that probably are frankly going to look a lot like the European system, um, although there's not a system there. There's you know, 25 systems. Um, so you know, if you you know, you back that all the way up and you say, you know, regulatory environment is more difficult um, in part because of all the successes we've had. We've now got to compare to the past successes to get the new products. Uh, that the, um, you know, that the environment for launching new products uh, and all the rest is going to be tougher. Uh, the pricing is going to be tougher and the profitability is probably going to be um, more challenging. That's on the one hand, that's in the U.S., but you also have some other things that are counterweights to that, which is new big opportunities that didn't exist 10 years ago in places like India, China, and for that matter, um, some of the new EU countries and Latin and South America. So 
Um, you know, I think it's overall going to create some pressure on, on the companies in the U.S. and those who are U.S. centric uh, are going to suffer it the most. And the more your business you're doing with the government, the worse you are. You know, the worse the effect is immediately. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's my general view. So uh, I um, let me put it in a different way. Uh, for the last um, uh, ten years, we have been talking about healthcare reform. Um, and uh, it, I remember 1992, 93, uh, Hillary uh, was trying to do healthcare reform uh, kind of in the basement without telling much to anybody. And it was uh, problematic because out of that came, let's have price controls on breakthrough drugs. And, and uh, it was tough because that's like, uh, uh, you know, I don't want to use this uh, disrespectfully, but. Uh, Oil uh, wells, they, uh, you know, to, uh, to put a, pr a control on it that uh, we, we will control. Once you're successful and you find the oil, we will uh, put a control on it. The, the number of wells uh, being drilled will decrease. Um, and we had an immediate impact at that time. And, and Wall Street stepped away from funding uh, uh, the kind of risk uh, research that we, all of us are engaged in. Um, uh, the interesting thing is that that did not happen at this time. Mm -hmm. uh, why didn't that happen? Um, I, I think it didn't happen because this particular uh, set of discussions didn't focus on the cost of innovation. It focused on the cost of access. Um, and that's a fundamentally a different thing. In fact, we could say that uh, in, uh, innovation was somewhat uh, talked about in a benevolent way. Sim biosimilars, for instance, uh, uh, you know, the data exclusivity run by bi uh, uh, biosimilars is 12 years. Uh, the president liked seven years, ended up 12 years. There was support for the need to be able to take the risk necessary to innovate. Um, this administration is actually interested in innovation. Uh, NIH does find some su support. FDA does find some su uh, support uh, uh, in this moment. It's also uh, pretty logical that we can't, we can't save our way out of treating uh, 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 Alzheimer's disease. You know, Alzheimer's disease needs to be solved through discovery. Diabetes, heart disease, cancer, or Parkinson's, all the things that, us, that all of us are working on so hard demand in discovery, not more hospitals, not more savings. Uh, and I think that's broadly seen as well. Uh, I also have to say that uh, in our experience, the kind of uh, products that we've brought to Europe, uh, where there is heavy government control, uh, or in Canada, uh, we've done fine with uh, monopolistic buyers. Uh, so you can actually uh, be successful. Uh, and we have a pricing policy that says uh, we are pretty much the same uh, throughout the world, uh, US or Europe or wherever it is. Um, and uh, so true innovation, true contribution, I think will continue to be supported. And I think in this, uh, what I conclude from I'm actually happy that, this, that we are at this moment now. We can move on. We have a set of stuff, and I would agree with Jim, there's a lot of stuff there that's tough to visualize how that it becomes self-financing. Uh, but what I also saw was uh, some recognition of the need for society to have the incentives necessary to innovate. And that's what we're all about, so I'm optimistic. Well, I think we're uh, timed out, but I want to thank Jim and Henry for making themselves available and just you know, giving us some insights from su two such incredibly successful uh, landmark companies that I'm sure so many in the audience would like to, to emulate. So thanks a lot. Thanks, Deborah.